We're now well over halfway through the course of this Parliament, and with various issues at the forefront of public debate, we speak to Jason McCartney, the MP for Colne Valley, about the issues he has tackled during his time in office. Well, I'm joined today by Jason McCartney. Jason, thank you very much for your time. Hi, Tom. You're very welcome. Pleasure to be with you. Um, Please, first of all, tell us a bit about yourself, about your background. I mean, 40 or 50 years ago, Parliament was full of giants. It was full of people who ran businesses, were in the military. And you are seemingly an ever less common phenomenon in Parliament these days, in that you actually worked in the real world before going into your parliamentary career. Tell us a bit more about that, please. Well, I'm very lucky, actually, because I've had two completely separate careers before I was elected to Parliament in 2010. Um, I was a Royal Air Force officer for 10 years. Um, I joined the Royal Air Force soon after leaving school. I didn't go to university. Uh, I could have gone, but I wanted to join the Royal Air Force. Travelled the world, um, served in places like Turkey, Iraq, uh, Las Vegas in the United States. Um, and then at the age of 28, uh, I did go to university to do a postgraduate course in broadcast journalism. And then I worked as a television uh, and radio journalist for another 10 years for BBC for a year and then for ITV. Uh, for Yorkshire Television, so covering this part of the world, which is an area that I love. So both in the Royal Air Force and in journalism, I came into contact with politicians, but I'd never worked in politics before. I stood for Parliament for the first time in 2010. Um, I'm very proud that I was elected to represent the area where my family have lived for 30 years. My mum and dad live a mile up that way. Um, family and friends are here. Um, it's a beautiful part of the world and it's a great honour being the Member of Parliament for here. Well tell us what it was like on that, that first night where you heard the words Jason McCartney elected as MP for Colne Valley. What sort of feelings run through the mind and, 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 and what sort of questions run through your mind when you realise that you've got this massive responsibility over so many people for the next few years? Well it was actually 20 past 5 in the morning on the Friday morning when my count was completed. Um, and it was actually utter exhaustion really, because nervous exhaustion and working really hard with my campaign team means that hardly slept for two days. And we'd actually had a bit of a curry round at a friend's house with all my campaign team the night before, and they'd all tucked in, but I didn't really have much of an appetite, so I'd hardly eaten for two days. Um, we'd been working hard for three and a half years, so on the day itself, uh, getting all of my supporters out to vote, um, and working hard um, meant that we were absolutely exhausted but it was 20 past 5 in the morning thanked everybody everyone went off to bed but my brother gave me a lift up to mum and dad's house and had a bacon butty and a coffee mum and dad had actually gone to bed at about 4 in the morning not knowing whether I'd been successful or not um, went home for a couple of hours sleep uh, the examiner rang me and said oh can we take some photos and that weekend was just uh, thanking people uh, I had a thank you party for the hundreds of people that have worked really, really hard and helped me out. Uh, and then on the Sunday morning I woke up and I thought I should really be doing something now as the Member of Parliament. Uh, and one of the senior party people rang me up and said come down to London tomorrow. Uh, and then we're off and running and it's strange actually as a Member of Parliament, no one actually tells you what to do, really. There are the whips that tell you or well, encourage you to vote with the government, but I've voted against government 33 times and I always vote in what the best interest is for my constituents. But in terms of having this office here in Home Firth, no one told me to have an office here in Home Firth, you don't even need to have an office, but I wanted to. I share this office with two businesses, so it's very cost effective. So there's people working upstairs on, on design and websites. I'm in the heart of Home Firth. It's easy to explain where we are. No one told me to employ three local people, but I wanted to. Um, no one told me to have an assistant in London. No one tells me to have surgeries on a Saturday out and about in the community. Nobody told me to visit businesses and support them. You, every MP is completely different. And, and you do what you think is in the best interest of your community. So the, the first moment you got down to London and you actually walked through Westminster Hall and made your way through into the House of Commons for that, uh, presumably the first debate, um, what kind of feelings run through your mind then? Is that when it really hits home? Because I imagine there's, there's kind of a, uh, a period of getting used to the fact you've just been elected when you haven't actually been down to London yet. So what happened when you got down to London? Well, I'd only ever been to Parliament even before for, I think, for a combined total of like 22 minutes. I've been for a quick cup of tea for an MP that had been like a mentor, but I only met him once, and we spoke on the phone a few times, 
and then on a quick trip um, to Parliament when I'd been younger, and that was it. I'd never, I'd never knew Westminster Hall existed. I'd never been through it before. It's a thousand years old. Uh, so the history of the place, um, it was like being a little lost boy on first day at school, to be honest. Uh, it was all new. Um, I was completely wide-eyed to it all. And I'm still learning. I, d I don't know everything. I never studied politics at university or anything. I'm still learning as procedural uh, things come up which I haven't experienced before but the good thing is you can ask people and people will always give you advice um, and I'm learning as I go on and I'm, I'm gradually rather than doing everything right at the beginning wanting to do everything I got my feet under the table and now I, I'm feeling confident and now I'm taking on more responsibility for example just going on to the transport select committee uh, in the past few months and now I'm also on the 1922 executive um, for the Conservative Party, so I'm ready to take on more responsibility uh, rather than doing it, wanting to do everything straight away. Um, I think I've done it really well in the right way. Well, of course, you briefly, you briefly mentioned that you were mentored. You were mentored, of course, by Douglas Carswell, yep. MP for Clacton. Uh, what kinds of qualities do you feel you've picked up from him, and how did he help you learn about how to conduct yourself as an MP? Well, Douglas uh, is, a, is a great MP at engaging with his uh, local community. Um, and again, it, you know, politics, I, I actually don't think of myself as a politician. I think of myself as a local champion, and that's what, that's what Douglas does, really. You know, supporting businesses, supporting schools. People are happy if they've got a job, they're earning some money, and they've got a good social life. It's not rocket science, it's not difficult. So that's what I do day in, day out. You know, what do businesses need here to thrive? Do they need more premises so that they can expand? Can they win more orders? Are they taking on apprenticeships? Um, and being a local champion, so I'm banging the drum for this area. I worked hard to get government funding for the Tour de France. It's actually gonna be coming past this window here. So if you wanna come and book your place here to see Chris yeah. Froome and Bradley Wiggins, let me know. Absolutely. So, and that is gonna be fantastic for the area as well. So being a champion for the area, whether it's championing Huddersfield Town, winning at Wembley and playing well, uh, businesses expanding. I went to Disposables UK last Friday, opening a big new uh, factory, um, taking on more apprentices, winning new orders, and their turnover between now and 2018 will go up from 10 million to 30 million, and that's bringing jobs and prosperity to the area. And, and that's what Douglas is all about. You know, it's not complicated. It's not rocket science. It's being a champion for your, for your area and doing the right things. You know, and when you don't agree with your party. Do it in a constructive way, um, rather than just doing it as a troublemaker. And as I say, you know, I'm a strong, independent voice, and if something's not right for my area, I will say so, and I won't support it. But I will do it in a constructive way. Well, I'll just turn us now to a more of a local issue. Um, fairly early on in your tenure, you tackled a what was referred to as a tainted blood issue. Yeah. An issue where certain patients were given transfusions that infected them with various diseases, many of them debilitating and life-threatening. Um, how did you handle that issue? What are the details of it and, and what has been the outcome for those who were sadly victimised by that? Yeah, this is called the contaminated blood scandal. Um, in the 1970s and 1980s, over 4,000 uh, people, many of whom were haemophiliacs and needed blood transfusions, or people had accidents and went to A&E and hospitals, were given blood products which were contaminated with CJD, which is the human form of mad cow disease, hepatitis C, or even HIV. Of those over 4,000 people, over 2,000 of them have now died because of those diseases they contracted. There have been a series of um, government compensation funds that have been set up, but obviously it's never enough. Um, as the victims die, how are those families? Uh, coping with having lost uh, their loved ones and, and how are they being financially supported. I actually came across this as an issue. I was vaguely aware of it in the back of my mind, but I didn't know all the details. A constituent came to see me, who lives in Lindley, very early on, and I found out I've got five other constituents who have been affected by this, and I thought I'll get stuck into this issue. Um, I sponsored a debate in Parliament. Uh, we got an improved offer from the government in terms of financial support and I've set up an all-party parliamentary group which I chair with a Labour MP 
And that is a way that you can make a difference as a Member of Parliament. This is an issue I really didn't know a lot about, but I've got stuck into it on behalf of my constituents. And now I am seen as the specialist on this campaign in Parliament and across the country. And I get very heartwarming letters from across the country from people who are grateful for what we're trying to do on their behalf. Um, and that's when you go to bed at night and you think, yeah, I am making a difference. I am helping people. Um, and you've just seen in my office out there the number of thank you cards as well. If you do things for the right reasons and try and help people, and that's what we like to do. Yeah, well, you mentioned government compensa compensation, and um, so you did say that it's never enough. So, do you feel in the aftermath of what's gone on, do you feel that really people have had justice done in terms of that, in terms of seeing money? Uh, but of course, it's not just about money; it's about emotional support as well. So, do you really feel that every single case has been treated uh, valuably? they've received the right amount of support in the aftermath of what's gone on? Well, it's difficult because um, different pe people have, have, have actually um, been infected with different diseases, as I say, and the way in which the government, past governments and, and the NHS have done it is, th is that they've actually treated people bearing in mind which disease they've got, whether it's hepatitis, as I say, CJD or HIV. Um, and people, you know, some some people, um, uh, th their life expectancy may be, be a few years, or with hepatitis C, they could live with it for 30 years. So, but money can never compensate for, for losing your health, really. Um, and also, there's a stigma attached to it as well. I mean, if you've been infected with HIV, do you want people to know your HIV? Because pe some people might not want to go around you. What jobs can you do? Could you work in a restaurant, for example, or could you, would someone allow you to work where you come into contact with children as well? So you're right, it, it's not just money. Money can't compensate for being given. If you're, you know, you, some, some were just haemophiliacs as a, as a child and they need regular blood transfusions, and here they were, and um, people should have gone to jail over it. Um, different countries as well. Ireland, by the way, have come up with a, uh, a, a huge compensation sensation package. However, of course, not as many people were affected there. Um, well, given your history in the RAF, defence must also have taken your interest in your time in Parliament. Um, what are your opinions on the many wars that we've been fighting now over the past 10 or 12 years, Iraq, Afghanistan, and now of course the big issue being Syria and what's going to happen with Syria, Mali as well. Um, what do you tend to find your opinion is on that? Do you think we're simply fighting in too many places at once? Do you think we're dedicating to things which really should be left to those countries to sort out themselves? Give us some background on that. What are your thoughts? Well, we are a nation, we punch above our weight, but we are on the UN Security Council, and I think we play a very important role in the world. But all these conflicts that we've either got involved with or we're thinking of getting involved with are all completely different. However, any future involvement uh, around the world it is going to be um, directed um, because of what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan. I think it's going to be very, very difficult for us to get widespread public support for any involvement in Syria uh, because of the legacy of Afghanistan and Iraq. However, Afghanistan and Iraq were very, very different. Um, Iraq was about regime change, removing Saddam Hussein, uh, but also the threat of weapons of mass destruction which weren't there. We must remember we went into Afghanistan though because the terrorists who committed the atrocities on 9-11 and 7-7 were actually training in terrorist training camps in Afghanistan. There was a legitimate reason that by going in there, cutting off the supply of, of training for terrorists there, it was making the streets of Britain a safer place. So two completely different reasons. Syria um, is a civil war. Um, I don't support um, arming the rebels and I don't think the government does now as well. The government has said that if there ever was a proposal to do that, there would be a vote in Parliament, and there wouldn't be any support in Parliament for that. We, we've had 444 British deaths in Afghanistan. We've had some very close to home here. Private Thomas Rowe was just in the next village, Meltham, he was 18 years of age. I've got to know his family really well. Um, and I think because of that, and quite rightly so, um, we will be very, very wary as a country before we get involved militarily in any other conflicts around the world. 
Well, of course, this may be an issue which people in the local area may have a strong view on. We've got to bring it back to your local constituents. Do you tend to find the view on the doorstep is somewhat a, an aggrieved view in that they, they feel we're sending too many young people off, or do you find that there is doorstep support for these ventures? Well, <laughs> we've got to remember that there are people that don't like our soldiers dying, um, but we have a voluntary armed forces and I signed up to serve my country, uh, as did other people as well. Um, and you serve your country. And unfortunately, sometimes in military situations, the worst thing that can happen is you can die on behalf of your country. The sacrifice our 444 servicemen have made in Afghanistan have no doubt made our country safer. They have saved civilian lives, men, women and children, from being blown up by terrorists who don't like our Western way of life and we should remember that. Their sacrifice has not been in vain. It has made the world a safer place. Iraq was a completely different situation. People like to lump Iraq and Afghanistan together, but that's wrong to do that. Each problem place in the world is completely different. You can't just say we shouldn't get involved in anything or we should get involved in everything. Um, both are wrong. Um, but obviously any future involvement now is going to be tainted by um, our experience and our losses in Afghanistan. We are withdrawing from Afghanistan and there is an opportunity to make it uh, a stable transition and I hope we're going to do that. But when people say to me, Jason, you know, does anyone else have to die? Let's come back from Afghanistan now. I say, what do you mean by now? Do you mean tonight? Do you mean our helicopters take our troops out of forward operating bases, leaving artillery and machine guns in place and just leaving 20 Afghan policemen in a deserted forward operating base? Do you mean tomorrow? We've got 14,000 armoured vehicles there. Do we just leave them with the keys in the ignition, with the engine running? Or do you mean next week? Or do you mean next month? To withdraw in an orderly place means we're coming out next year and that's the right thing to do. But we have to give them a chance, the Afghan police and army, of, of having a safe transition, you know. Um, and I think when you explain that to people, they understand it. The problem is in this modern age, people see a headline in the newspaper, they have a quick decision about something or they read a Twitter comment of 160 characters or whatever it is. But when you, if you get the opportunity to actually explain it to people, they understand, but we don't always get the opportunity to explain everything to people. Yeah, I mean, I would make a comment in um, particular relation to Mali as well, because the uh, the issue stressed there was that we would provide logistical support mm -hmm. on the back of the exploits of the French going into there, um, and there was a point made that Vietnam started through logistical support on the part mm -hmm. of the Americans. To an extent, isn't there a great chance that um, conflicts can turn into things and 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 um, different things can happen according to what was planned, it could blow up into something again, um, much more than what we first thought it would be. Yes it could, but you know the alternative sometimes is to do nothing. Um, I was in a Syrian refugee camp on the Iraq border three weeks ago with 130,000 Syrian refugees. I've spoken to the refugees, I've looked in the children's eyes and they don't have their parents. Their parents have been murdered as a caring human being from the United Kingdom, I am proud of the fact that we do what we can to relieve suffering in the world. There are also people as well, Tom, that say we shouldn't be spending money on international aid. We are talking about spending 0.7% of our GDP. So if I have £100 on the table here, five £20 notes, we're talking about 70 pence. And that's all we're talking about. I am proud that we are a caring, compassionate nation. And even though we're facing some you know, financial challenges in our own country, that we still have it within us to stop young children dying from treatable diseases. And I am very proud of that. And we have actually reformed international aid so it doesn't go to dictators anymore, it actually saves lives. And when there was refugees in this Syrian refugee camp, Domiz, they were in tents supplied by the UK government and they had a union jack on. All the children came and thanked me. They are aware that we are saving them and, uh, and helping make their lives better. And I'm very, very proud of that. And I will stand up for that day in, day out. You're clearly very passionate about that kind of issue and um, I'll bring us on now to another issue which you've had quite a bit of involvement in and that is the European Union. You are a um, signator of the People's Pledge yep. and uh, you've spoken about this before yep. in Parliament. Um, back in October, in, I believe it was 2010 I think, 
Um, the vote for the European Union referendum was a three-line whip against. More recent votes have been a three-line whip for. To what extent does this represent progress and to what, ex to what extent does this represent your view? Well, I'm a Democrat. I believe in people having their say. I was elected to be someone's Member of Parliament. <clears throat> we shouldn't shy away from letting people have their say. And you know, it's, it's a festering, simmering issue, this, about our relationship with the EU. I'm very clear-cut. If we have the vote today about whether to stay in the European Union or leave, I would vote to leave. I am quite happy to wait and see what powers the Prime Minister can bring back. I want the referendum in 2017. Um, but if nothing has changed, I would vote to, to come out as well. I'm, I'm a proud Briton. We do have a strong place in the world. Um, and just, I, I talked about the company, I was speaking, you know, I went to the new factory on Friday in Meltham. You know, their markets are the United States, you know, their markets are India and the emerging nations. But to think that, you know, the Germans wouldn't still want to sell us their Mercedes and the Volkswagen's car if we weren't within the single market, that's complete and utter rubbish. And we need to dispel those myths. But this is a festering issue, so let's put it to bed in the same way that we put to bed. Uh, voting changes with the AV referendum. No one talks about changing the voting system anymore. Why? Because we had a referendum on it and it was thrown out by a big majority. And that's why we're having the referendum on Scottish independence. If the Scots vote to stay as part of the United Kingdom, which I hope they do, um, that will put it to bed once and for all and that will kill Alex Salmon's goose once and for all as well. And we can be a strong United Kingdom. But let's not be frightened about it. This issue has been festering for ages. Politicians of all colours have promised this referendum, so let's just have it and, and let's trust the people. But in doing so, let's have the debate, and I'm very, very happy to do that. Well, the AV referendum took place fairly quickly as mm -hmm. the, uh, the Parliament established. Um, however, it could be asserted that there is some difference in that between that and the Scottish referendum and the EU referendum as well. The plan for the Scottish referendum has been going around for a long time, people have heard about it for a long time and it's going to be the case with the EU as well because it's four years from now. Isn't there a chance that this, this issue could still fester to a point uh, where in 2017 people are so fed up of hearing about the issue as opposed to having it next year, we're having it in four years, couldn't people get so fed up that actually they're sick of hearing about it and it affects the way they vote in four years time? Um, well, you could argue that's what's happening with the Scottish independence, but I think, I, you know, a bit of me says, you know, let's just have it tomorrow, but I can see, I, I can see what the Prime Minister's trying to do, you know, you know, what, we're actually going to have an in-out referendum, but in doing so, what kind of Europe, for those that want to vote in, what kind of Europe is it? Um, and I think I can really understand and you know, appreciate the Prime Minister's logic is he accepts that Europe is not working at the moment. For those that want to stay in, let's at least have an offer of something that might work. And for those that want to come out, you know, we have the clear choice on the ballot paper. So there is logic into what he's trying to do. Of course. And another one of those issues is with regards to green energy. Yeah. Now, a particular journalist at The Telegraph listed you as among a, a few Tory MPs who'd mm -hmm. signed up to certain green initiatives, had mm -hmm. backed carbon saving initiatives, mm -hmm. and on the back of that had said that come the next election, you can effectively kiss goodbye to this seat. Forget whatever you've done in the community forget what your views are on any other issue, the fact that you've gone in this certain direction on this certain issue, you're going to lose your seat. What would your response be to that journalist? Uh, well, it's the first I've heard that, to be honest. Um, I actually look at issues in a practical way and what's in the best interest of my constituents. Like I was saying earlier on things like Syria, Iraq or Afghanistan, things are shortened to a, a little snippet of a statement. Um, I actually vote on amendments and bills that are put in front of me. I saw an opportunity when we were talking about clean green energy of actually cracking on and getting some nuclear power to create low carbon energy at a good price that keeps the lights on and is secure for the United Kingdom. The problem is when you talk about you know, clean energy, low carbon energy, everyone immediately thinks about wind turbines dotted all over the countryside. No, it's so much more than that. You know, there is, you know, people forget about that. We need to crack on and, and get some nuclear power stations so that we can get the lights on 
um, keep it at a decent price for everybody uh, and I saw an opportunity to do that. The problem is these debates are you know, narrowed down to little snippets of things and people need to understand as well newspapers uh, are views papers. The journalists have a view uh, and you only need to read the cross-section of newspapers that the Telegraph now has it in for the government on a whole variety of issues and no matter what we do um, they won't be supportive. Um, but green energy is just so much more than, I mean I don't want windmills, wind turbines dotted all over the countryside, but I want investment into low carbon energy, but car low carbon energy that belongs to the United Kingdom so people can have energy uh, that is at a low price and that they can afford. And I thought that that was the right thing to support. And if anyone actually, if that journalist had actually sat and read through the energy bill and the amendments rather than just writing an article based on the back of misinformation, uh, he would be in a much better place. So uh, he's talking a load of rubbish. People just narrow these arguments down to, oh, he likes wind turbines on hills or he doesn't. It's not about that. And that's why I'm proud that actually, as an MP for this area, I actually look at issues properly and make the right decisions, not just on what some poxy journalist in the Daily Telegraph wants me to do. Well, you've mentioned that you've got quite a lot of thank you cards outside on top of the cabinet there. And it, it's quite clear that quite a few people in this constituency trust you. But the problem is they don't trust everyone, do they? And um, obviously in the past, uh, much of it before you came into Parliament, there were some fairly liberal and sometimes illegal expenses claims. And there are still stories today of such things going on. Uh, pretty much high profile these days, the uh, MP's pay rise. Um, are you taking that pay rise? And what kinds of things do you think we could do to restore trust to politicians uh, in the short and long term? I think there's a lot of the misinformation that goes on about it and one of the things I'm really keen to do is people to actually come and meet me, see what I do and see what the reality is. A lot of young people have done work experience with me and they go, oh I never realised you do this. Um, it's hard work being an MP, I'm never off duty but I fully accept that and I love what I do. Um, I worked all day last Saturday, all Saturday afternoon, it was a sunny afternoon, I was in Slathwaite Civic Hall doing my advice surgery, helping people right up till you know, tea time and I've been out all morning as well and you know, I work day in day out. There is never a day where I haven't done work emails, ever. Um, I'm taking one week's holiday this summer um, to take my girls away on a little one week break. That's my only holiday this year. Um, you know, I'm not making out I'm a saint or anything because there's lots to do and I enjoy doing it. But there's a lot of information spread by the press. We're on recess at the moment. Here I am in my constituency office and I've just told you what I'm doing. I'm meeting the bank to encourage them to lend to businesses. I'm going to go meet a community being blighted by bad parking. Um, I've been meeting constituents this morning. The press say, because Parliament isn't sitting, we're on a seven week holiday. So that's misinformation. They know that's not true, so why do they say it? In terms of expenses, yes, there were lots of incorrect expenses. People have been found out. They've changed the system. A lot of it, I think, was based around where MPs stay when they're in London. People were having mortgages or second homes. Um, now people can't have mortgage payments. I stay at RAF accommodation. Um, it's 78 quid a night. It's like a little mini hotel place. Um, and I don't pay for it when I'm not there. So I'm good value for money and, and that suits me. There are lots of things I could claim for like petrol and food I don't. Um, when constituents come down to Parliament and I take them for a cup of tea and a sandwich, I pay for it out of my own pocket. I don't claim for it. People don't realise that but you know that's just the way it is. In terms of, you mentioned the proposed pay rise, because of the expenses scandal, an independent body, IPSA, the Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority, was set up um, they've done a review of what MPs should be paid. They went around the country. They said, should an MP be paid the same as a head teacher or a police officer? And they've come back with, if we are going to be paid the same as a head teacher, we should actually be paid, I think it's £6,000 more. That is a proposal. It's not definite. It's going to be consulted on. I think it is wrong for us to get that at a time when people are only getting a 1% public sector pay rise. I will find a way to not take that because it would be wrong for me to take it. How I would do that, I don't know. I give hundreds of pounds to charity as it is. Maybe there will be a way to do that, but I've been quite clear cut. I don't want to take that pay rise. If, if it does go through, I'm not sure it will go through, to be honest. It will be after 2015 anyway, um, and I would find a way of not taking it. So. 
Uh, there tend to be a few MPs, they, they've got a long time to campaign before they actually get into that seat. You yourself spent several years campaigning in this seat beforehand, before you actually got elected. Um, and in that time, there is a lot of time to decide whether your base wage will help you and help you live your life normally, see your children, see your family, get from A to B, from your constituency to Parliament. And yet seemingly having, after having a lot of time to decide, there are MPs who have gone down to Parliament and a few months into their time in office they're saying, well, I can't see my children, I can't see my family, I can't do this and that, I need more money, I need to claim expenses and so on. Isn't there enough time to think about these things before you go into the big, big decision of campaigning to become a Member of Parliament? That's a good point and we're very, very open to transparency now. Everyone can see uh, everything that we claim, which is good, and it's up to every MP to justify what they do. Um, I've answered your questions, I can only talk for myself. Uh, my constituents and see me out and about working hard. Um, they see what I claim, I'm very good value for money. Um, I don't want to use the phrase cheapest, but I'm the best value uh, MP in Kirklees by quite a way. Uh, and I will continue to do so. Um, I'm not extravagant in any way at all. Um, and I think every MP has to justify themselves to their own constituents and you know, people make a judgment. There are some people out there that don't want MPs to be paid any money at all. You know, there are, you know, but there is a, there is a debate to be had, you know, what, what people get paid. So, um, but it's not an issue for me. Um, I'm, I'm very happy with things. I work hard um, and I enjoy representing this part of the world. So it's not something I think about a lot, to be honest. And just lastly, your thoughts on Huskfield Town's season ahead, what's going to happen? Um, well, I'm off to see them in their friendly against Real Betis tonight. Uh, we've had some good signings. I like the idea of Patterson, obviously Vaughan up front, and Johnny Stead coming back as well. Um, it was very nail-biting at the end of last season against Barnsley to stay up in the Championship. But, you know, I've, I've been a town fan since the 1980s when we first moved to Huddersfield. and. Uh, we used to get crowds of four and a half thousand and we didn't have a very good team then but we can get crowds of 15, 16,000 and it's, it's great for the town. I'm a season ticket holder, book my own season ticket um, and, and when Huddersfield Town do well or the Huddersfield Giants who are top of Super League at the moment win, it puts a spring in everybody's step and you know we saw what happened with the Olympics last year, we've got the Tour de France coming here next year, um, sport um, can bring a nation together and it's good for people to be fit and healthy. Uh, I ran the London Marathon this year for the first time, I absolutely loved it. Raised three and a half thousand pounds for the Forget Me Not Children's Hospice, I'll be running it again next year. Um, so sporting activity makes you feel fitter and healthier and brings people together and team spirit. So I hope Huddersfield Town, I've got my mug there, my, my town mug. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll do well this season, maybe even push towards the edge of the playoffs. So I don't want a nail-biting fight against relegation again. Of course not. Well, Jason, pleasure talking to you. Cheers, Tom. Thank you very much for your time. You're very welcome. Thank you.